Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight, despite the, the cloudy weather. I don't think we'll get any observing tonight, unfortunately, but fingers crossed, maybe things will clear up in the next bit. Um, I'm Dr. Cameron Hummels. I am a research astronomer here at Caltech, and I will be your MC for this evening's event. Uh, so a rough schedule of how tonight will proceed. In a few moments, I'll introduce our speaker, who is going to speak for about 30 minutes or so about this amazing proposed telescope on the far side of the moon. And following that, we'll, we'll have a few questions from the audience for a few moments. And um, after maybe five minutes or so, we'll immediately transition into a Q&A panel where you can ask questions not only of the speaker on the content of the presentation, but also a few other members of the department who work on different, yes, these members of the department and myself who work on different areas of astrophysics. And we'll try and field questions that you may have on any uh, space related or astronomy or astrophysics related questions that, that have been keeping you up at night or that perhaps you've read about in the news. And that'll go on until 9.45 or 10. Now you're free to, you know, after the talk, oh, I'm done with this and storm out in a huff, or you can stick around and ask a question or leave whenever you want. Now, normally during that Q&A panel, we would have observing going. We may still, but it's probably unlikely given the, the weather conditions outside. Even the, the nearly full moon doesn't yet appear to be visible because of the opacity of the, of the clouds on the horizon, but, but we'll see. Stay tuned. What's that? Yeah, exactly. So ho hopefully, hopefully we get some clearing. We'll see. Um, these events take place once a month on Friday nights here. Sadly, our next one will not be uh, in October. We will break our monthly chain of like seven years or so. I'm going to be out of town. I am starting tomorrow. I am driving to the Grand Canyon where I will be the astronomer in residence at the Grand Canyon for the next six weeks. So if you fancy a trip to the Grand Canyon, even despite the government shutdown, Arizona has pledged to keep the Grand Canyon open. Um, and we'll be, I'll, I'll be leading a bunch of astronomy outreach events there, um, lectures. We're going to have some astronomy on taps there. And there's going to be, notably, there's going to be an annular solar eclipse that takes place two weeks from tomorrow. Um, so this will take place Saturday morning, October 14th here. Uh, in Pasadena and Los Angeles area that will manifest as a partial solar eclipse, which means that's when you've got the earth here, you've got the sun here and the moon comes in between. Now the moon isn't going to totally block out the light of the sun. That would be a total solar eclipse, but this will be um, from here in Pasadena, it'll be a partial. So the moon will partially cover up the sun. And if you didn't know that it was going to happen, you probably wouldn't notice. But one thing that you can get, and I'll bring some down um, after the presentation. If you're wearing eclipse glasses uh, and you look up at the sun, which you can safely do because it blocks the bulk of the light of the sun, you can see that instead of seeing a circle of light of the sun, you'll see a crescent of the sun. And here in Pasadena, it'll cover about 70, at, at maximum coverage, it'll cover about 70% of the sun. So you'll see a big, nice crescent. Um, other ways that you can safely view an eclipse are with pinhole cameras. So if you, it's not really a camera, it's just a pinhole in a thing. So if you take like a piece of tin foil and poke a hole in it and hold it up so that the light only goes through that pinhole, normally what it would do is it'll show a, a circle where it's projecting because it's projecting an image of the, the light source. But during a partial solar eclipse, instead of pro projecting a circle, it'll project a crescent. And it's a safe way to view instead of just like blindly looking up the sun. Don't do that. Don't do that. Uh, you need to have some sort of protection for your eyes. But we will have an event going on here. Um, there will be uh, a couple of solar eclipse and solar research related presentations that take place in this auditorium at 8.30 a.m. and at 9.30 a.m. on Saturday, October 14th. And we'll try to live stream them. Right now we're live streaming this to YouTube. So if you want to check it out later, you can check it out later. Um, I'll see if we can live stream that. But we'll have telescopes and eclipse glasses and uh, solar activities going on in the fields directly behind us from 8.30 until 10.30. It'll be occurring that whole time at different levels of coverage, but the peak level of coverage is at about 9.30 a.m. So you can sleep in a little bit and still see the eclipse. 
If you feel like going further afield, you can join us. I will be leading an event in Bryce Canyon National Park, which also the Utah government has pledged to keep it open despite any kind of federal government shutdown. Um, and we'll, we'll have solar telescopes and um, eclipse glasses and activities and such for people who want to see the annular eclipse, which is where the, the moon totally covers up the sun, but it leaves a little bit of, bit of the sun kind of poking through. So people refer to it as a ring of fire, because if you look with eclipse glasses, you'll see this red ring in the sky. Um, but it doesn't get dark like a total solar eclipse. The next one of those will be in April of next year and not visible from here. You'll have to go to like Texas or Tennessee or New England, but good trip plans. So consider that. We'll have an event probably going on the Texas-Mexico border at that point. So uh, stay tuned for that. Anyway, I'm getting way off topic here. So um, that'll happen in two weeks. I'll put more stuff on our social media and our website when we have more firm plans, but I'm still working those out. Um, in addition to our stargazing lectures, oh, so our next stargazing lecture will take place Friday, November 17th, which is the Friday preceding Thanksgiving. And the presentation will be about when stars have tantrums, this is the literal title, stellar tantrums, when they have a big tantrum and throw off a storm of material and what effect that could have on life if it existed on planets around those stars. And we know this based on how our sun sometimes has a tantrum, also known technically as a coronal mass ejection or a solar flare, and what impact it has for life here on the Earth. So um, our speaker will be talking about that Friday, November 17th. And in addition to our stargazing lectures, we have a, a series of events called Astronomy on Tap that take place at a local bar at the Dog House Bar in Old Town, Pasadena. These are fun events. They're all family, all ages events, but if you are of age, you can consume beer um, or whatever spirit you choose and listen to a couple of um, astronomy talks by different scientists, like 15 minute. And we also have astronomy pub trivia and it's, it's super fun. Many of you I recognize from having come and it's pretty fun, right? It's a pretty good time. So, um, and there's live music and such. So the next one of those will be Monday, November 13th. We won't have any for the month of October unless you go to the Grand Canyon, which is a ways to drive. So uh, I think those are all my announcements for now. So leads me to my introduction of our uh, esteemed speaker for the evening. Our speaker originally hails from Southern India, did her undergraduate studies at, in Coimbatore in Southern India before she then did research studies in Bangalore, India, and then she came and did her PhD at Arizona State University in Phoenix, Arizona. And a year ago, she joined our department here at Caltech and is really doing some amazing stuff um, with radio astronomy, astronomy that we can't see with our eyes, but we can detect with enormous um, instruments such as those in Owens Valley and other, other locations uh, around the globe. And she's gonna talk about a telescope that isn't even potentially on the globe that's on the far that might be built on the far side of the the moon to be able to do some even more groundbreaking science from that location so please welcome our speaker for tonight dr nevedita mahesh thank you cameron thank you for all of you for being here today um so I'm going to be talking about possibly placing a telescope on the far side of the moon, but instead of me talking this entire evening, I decided let's have an interactive session for this talk. Uh, so I've put up this link. So if you could type this link in the available device you have, a phone, tablet, or laptop, and in your browser, it should be fine. And we would have an interactive discussion or talk today. So I'm going to give you all a minute to take this link down on your phones. Um, while you'll take that down, I do want to acknowledge that this crazy idea of mine of putting this telescope on the moon, the dream of mine started off at Arizona State University, hence I've left my affiliation with ASU for this talk. Um, yeah. Just going to give it a few more seconds. And... Okay, so we're going to be talking about placing a telescope on the far side of the moon. But wait, why do we want to place these telescopes on the far side of the moon? Let's step back and ask that question first. One, 
The timing is perfect, if I may. So NASA has, has returned its interest to go back to the moon with its Artemis mission. For those of you who don't know, uh, with this, the we had a successful launch. I mean, we had a successful testing launch earlier this year in May, where we tested the spacecraft, uh, we tested the ground systems, everything went successfully. So Artemis is a mission to go back to the moon to take humans back to the moon. Um, and on this mission, we astronomers are just piggybacking. We're going for a ride. Uh, so this is an overall goal for the Artemis mission, is to take humans back to the moon. But in this overarching goal, my favorite part of this mission is the commercial lunar payload services. What do I mean by that? What Art or NASA is aiming for is via Artemis, they are tying up with commercial partners to develop more sophisticated payloads, which don't place restrictions on the size of the telescope, the weight of this telescope. This gives us a way for us to place a bigger telescope if needed. So this is really lucrative for us. Why? Okay, so the timing is perfect, but we should have solid goals too. The second reason is there are two, there are a couple of compelling questions for which you will have to make observations from the moon. Compelling astrophysical questions, which are one, exoplanet studies, or is there life on other planets? Two, early universe cosmology, or I mean, how did the universe form? So for these two may, big questions, such some fundamental questions, if I may, we need to make observations from the moon. And let's understand together why. Okay, so the first one, okay, I must say, I heard Cameron mention the talk, the next stargazing lecture. I'm probably going to give you all a prelude to that lecture too right now. Uh, so the question I asked was, how do we study if there's life in other planets? And one possible way, this is one possible, Way. There are other ways to do it. This one possible way is to look for star planet interactions in radio waves. So now this wonderful diagram here, it was produced by Chuck Carter at Caltech. And what it's showing you here is a star, a host star that's actually throwing tantrums, if I may. Uh, it has a lot of solar flares and it has the coronal mass ejection that Cameron just mentioned. So it's like ejecting mass from its corona. Now these coronal mass injections then interacts with the planet around it that has a magnetic field. Now, when the coronal mass ejections interact with the magnetic field of the planet, it produces radio waves. It produces radio auroral emission. How does this help us tell if the planet has life or no is what we're going to understand together. I'm going to play a video to drive home that point. Again, this is the same, is the same scenario as shown in the diagram before, there are two cases of a host star emit, emitting the coronal mass ejection, but it interacts with two different planet scenarios, one on the left, one on the right. I'm not going to say more about what's happening, one on the left, one on the right. This is where comes the interactive portion, if I can go to the next slide. And I'm going to ask you all the question, what was the main difference you saw on the left and right? In both cases, the star is emitting a coronal mass ejection, but it interacts with two different planet scenarios. What are the things you all noted? Atmospheric structure. Sorry, say that again? Atmospheric structure. Atmospheric structure. Oh, you nailed the point there, right there, yeah. I'm just gonna give it a few more minutes if people want to type it in, but yes. There was a blue shock wave, yes. One has no magnetic field, absolutely, and magnetic fields, yes. Atmosphere, yes, okay, so you pretty much got the point home. So this is what we saw. So in one case, there was a magnetic field that produced the radio emission, and in the other case, there was no magnetic field. Now, if we look, if we are able to observe radio waves from a planet, it means it has a magnetic field. And if it has a magnetic field, it's probably protecting its atmosphere inside. And if it is protecting its atmosphere inside, you could possibly probe that planet further and test for life. Indirectly answering the question, is there life on that planet? So basically radio observations of planets could give you narrow down the exoplanets where we can go and further probe for atmosphere. Now, okay, so we know this is how we're gonna do it. What, how do we, let's think about how do we design this telescope? What frequencies should this telescope operate at? To do that, we have some clue from planets in our own solar system. 
So these radio emissions are produced by planets in our own solar system, and we have observed it. It is what I'm showing you in a plot here. This is frequency versus flux, which is pretty much the strength of the radio waves. And I'm showing you curves for Jupiter on the top, Saturn, Earth, and Uranus. So these are radio auroral emissions that we have measured from solar system planets. Now, with this, we have seen at where, where they produce. And with this, I'm going to ask you a question with this plot. So now, what, at what frequencies will you design the telescope to observe radio auroral emissions, possibly from other planets, using what we have seen in our own planet? And in our solar system. 42. Great. Can we have some units? I'm guessing my access, access has some units. <laughs> 42, 100. OK, I guess I'm, I'm guessing you'll mean megahertz. I'm guessing you'll mean the same frequency here. Max flux. I do want to get max flux, but at which frequency? <laughs> OK, but <laughs> overall, yes, you're right. So overall, we want these low numbers. We want anything lower than, let's say, 40 megahertz to observe these radio frequencies. So we want to design, we want to design a telescope that's operating less than 40 megahertz to look for these radio emissions from exoplanets. To just put this in perspective, to just give us a picture on the electromagnetic spectrum, I have plotted the electromagnetic spectrum and I'm showing you where these radio waves, 40 megahertz are radio waves. These are long wavelength waves, so meaning they're low energy and low frequency. They're very much away from the visible side, so you're not going to be able to see these waves. So we're not going to use optical telescopes, we're going to be using radio telescopes, So just to give us a picture. So now let's, we've learned this for the, for the first question, so let's put a pin on it, and let's talk about the second science question I left. So the second science question I asked was, we can use the moon, observations from the moon to answer how did the universe form. How are we going to do this? We're going to look back in time. How are we looking back in time? So let's, to understand that, I've drawn this little graphic. So just if, did you all know if you look at the moon now, you're looking at the moon as it was 1.3 seconds before. If we look at the sun right now, just don't look at the sun directly like Cameron recommended, let's use eclipse glasses and look at the sun. But if you're gonna look at the sun right now, you're looking as it was eight minutes back in time. So if the sun did have this tantrum, let's say the CME emission, you're not going to know till eight, months, eight, eight minutes later, right? So similarly, if you go further, if you go to Alpha Century, you're looking at, at that star as it was four years ago. And if you look at the nearest globular structure, we are looking at it as it was 25,000 years ago. Go to the nearest Galaxy, if you want to look at the nearest galaxy, you're looking at it as it was 2.5 million years ago. So what I'm trying to say here is, as you go further back in distance, you're probing further back in time. Telescopes are indeed time machines. <laughs> so with that, going back in time, let's go a little further back in time. So for that, I am plotting this timeline of our universe, starting from the Big Bang on the left to the present day on the right. Right? And this whole axis is about 13.8 13 billion years, because our universe is 13.8 billion years old. Now, on this timeline, going back from the present day, till about 4 billion years since start of time, or I'm saying about 9.8 billion years back in time, we have a lot of observations of galaxies, stars, black holes, interstellar medium, from so many different telescopes, I'm just showing you a subset of them. Why? Even during the period of when, even go back further in time and go to the era when the first stars were forming. There are telescopes aiming for it. We all know and love the JWST. And there are also, I'd like to highlight my personal favorites, the radio telescopes in Western Australia and Southern Africa are also probing for the era of the first stars. Why? Even the time after the Big Bang, just after the Big Bang, about 400, not just, about 400,000 years after the Big Bang, when the first light was emitted, we have a lot of data from telescopes like Planck and WMAP. I'm just going to pause here. There is a gaping hole, isn't there? There's no observations or planned instruments in this tiny region in between. And if I may, this is, these are the toddler years of our universe. This set the stage to the beginning of the first stars. And we have no observations. How are we going to say how did things form if you don't look at the epoch where it all started? 
So we let's do that together. And this is called the dark ages. This particular toddler years are called the dark ages. Why? Because it's before the first stars formed. There's no stars emitting light. There's no galaxies emitting light. And all that was there was hydrogen. The very first element in our periodic table, hydrogen just existed. So this is the dark ages and hydrogen just existed, but we want to observe it. How do we do it? We use hydrogen. We, let's just use hydrogen. Hydrogen is there. Hydrogen emits a characteristic signal and let's look for it. So to understand this characteristic signal, I have plotted this at a hydrogen atom. At the uh, top and bottom, they're just two copies of the hydrogen atom. Um, the center is the nucleus and around it is the electron revolving around the nucleus. So the hydrogen has one proton, one electron. So it's the hydrogen atom on the top and bottom. But if you notice carefully, there is you see the electron flip, right? So in the top case, the electron and the nucleus are rotating in the same aligned direction. I'm going to try doing it. In the bottom case, the electron is flipped and it's rotate. I can't do it. Never mind. It's trying to flip. It's trying to spin in the opposite direction as, as the nucleus. So when the electron spin flips from one to the other, it emits hydrogen atom emits a characteristic signal at 1,400. 20 megahertz or the equivalent wavelength is 21 centimeter. So this signal from hydrogen will be plenty because hydrogen is plenty, signal is plenty. Let's just look for this, right? Okay, so we're gonna look for this signal from dark ages, but we just decided for the exoplanet studies, we will design, together we decided, we will design a telescope that will operate below 40 megahertz. But we're gonna be looking for this hydrogen signal that is at 1.4 gigahertz or 1,400 megahertz from the dark ages. Why are we using this telescope to look at the signal? If you all had to guess. How are we using strength electron flip? Yeah, it is the electron flip signal, but that signal is at 1,400 megahertz. And our telescope, oh, red shift. Okay, I see, I saw blue shift and I got excited, but yeah, it is red shift. It is indeed redshift, you're right. So the signal is, when it was emitted at dark ages, it is 1,400 megahertz. But by the time it reaches us, it gets stretched. It gets stretched to higher wavelengths and lower frequency. I do have a little animation for that. I don't know why I kept doing this. <laughs> so, so there is the 1,400 megahertz signal from the dark ages, but by the time it reaches reaches us to the present day on Earth, it gets stretched. Now it's below 40 megahertz or it's at longer wavelengths. So we are at the same frequencies. We are the same frequencies as the exoplanet studies. The exoplanets also wants the telescope below 40 megahertz. The dark ages hydrogen signal also wants the telescope below 40 megahertz. Now let us try learn one more thing about this dark ages signal. So the signal is below 40 megahertz, but also theory predicts that since the signal is way back in time and way back in distance, it's really, really faint and weak. Theory, the main thing to take away from this, this is, let's say, this is frequency or time. You just say this is time, and this is the strength of the signal. The signal from dark ages is just 50 millikelvin. It's really tiny to give you context. Our Milky Way also emits radio frequencies, and it's about 10 power 4 Kelvin. It's about 10,000 Kelvin. And the signal we are looking for, it's 50 millikelvin. So it's really obscure. It's really tiny compared to everything else in the front of it. Okay. I said a Milky Way is emitting at the same frequency, but if I ask you all to guess or think of other objects or sources that emits or produces radiations at 50 or less. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Tesla, thanks. <laughs> Electro, me? <laughs> okay. Cell phones, yeah. Actually, me is not off, okay? So one thing, I now that somebody said me, I wanna make a comment, is that if you go to radio telescopes, you are roughly of the same wavelength as the radiation. You can alter the radiation, either your body absorbs it or ref re reflects it, so it's recommended not to be close to a radio telescope and interfere with our signal. Television, black holes, yep, all of it. So guys, yes, the noise is real. All our favorite devices, our own Milky Way galaxy is very bright. 
Other galaxies also produce at the same frequencies. There's not just Milky Way, other galaxies that are not the radio planet emission that we want. It's not the dark ages emission. Other galaxies will also produce radio waves. Finally, there's a problem even closer to home, the instrument. So let's say this is a graph I have of frequency versus strength of a signal. It's the green signal that we're looking for, but the, the black wiggles is what we always get. We all the signal with, we get is always with instrumental noise which is also an issue. To drive the point home and also for us to take a little bit of break, I wanted to have a little bit of an exercise on how weak the signal is and how, what a big problem it poses. So at this point, can I ask request for two volunteers? You don't have to come all the way here. You just have to, I'll ask you to do some small activity from your place. Yes, one. Can I get one more? Yes, okay. So the one in the front, you will be the cosmological signal of interest that we are looking for. The one behind, you will be, you'll be the radio waves that a Milky Way produces. Okay, so the cosmology signal of interest. Can I request you, okay, I might have to put my mic down. Can I request you to clap at the beat I'm going to give you? It's going to be one, two, three. The foreground signal, which is the Milky Way. So we know by theory that the foreground emission is slower in frequency, it's a slower beat. So I'm going to give you a slow beat. So on count of three, can I have the cosmology signal and the foreground signal clap simultaneously? One, two, three. So one second, yours was the faster beat, right? Can we have the cosmology, the one, two, three? Yes, okay, on count of three. One, two, three. Perfect, thank you. Audience, could you decipher just the cosmology signal? Can you separate, could you hear just the cosmology signal? There's some sort of filtering, right? You know you have to look for one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Fine, let's give a more realistic scenario. Cosmology signal, can you clap at a volume half of what you did? Foreground, can we go three times of the volume you just did? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, can we go and count to one, two, three? Yes, thank you. Could you all hear the cosmology signal? Yes, if you have an amplifier, you're looking for a certain beat. It's true, you can, right? Instruments can be tuned to be like, look for this beat. Now let me give you the actual realistic scenario. The cosmology and the foreground do the same thing you all did. All of you all, can you all clap at any frequency you like and any amplitude you like on the count of three? One, two, three. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I guess I got you all to clap for me. My job is done, but no. Uh, no. So this, this is what I'm trying to say. At this point, I don't know about you guys, but I couldn't, I couldn't hear my cosmology signal of interest. So this is the problem we're dealing with. We know some sources that we can separate, but most of the time there are sources we don't know and then we're constantly learning, we're constantly creating new filters, and this is the challenge we're dealing with. Speaking of nuisances, uh, do you know at what frequency does the ionosphere become opaque? And so at what frequencies the ionosphere start blo starts blocking radio frequencies in? Is it below 300, below 30, or the below 300 kilohertz? So far, it's below 30 megahertz. Yeah, you're all right. Yes. So the telescope we are looking for, we wanted to build a telescope below 40 megahertz, and our ionosphere blocks it. So we have to go to space. And let me tell you that uh, the, both the science case we are looking for, I told you it's really weak, right? The signal we are looking for is weak. So you need multiple telescopes to get enough data in. So we're talking about building hundreds of elements. So let's find a surface in space. The closest surface you can think of, let's go to the moon. So you've reached the near side of the moon. You've come all the way to the moon. You're still going to see all your cell phone, TV, still it's there. You're also going to see radio waves from the sun. Why? I told you this uh, Earth also produces auroral waves, radio auroral waves. You're going to see that. But we don't want to look at the Earth's auroral waves. We want to look at the exoplanets. So we've gone all the way to the moon. We might as well find the most radio quiet place you can find in the inner solar system so we're going to go to the far side of the moon 
and and to show you how pristine far side is in terms of radio uh, quiet we have this beautiful plot from but sadly it's from 1975 another reason why i think we should go back to the moon and update this plot and this particular plot is from 1975 it's from a orbiter that went around the moon by nasa it's called the rae orbiter and what i'm trying to show you here this is time versus the strength of the signal at different frequencies and the frequencies we're talking about 10 megahertz to about 20 250 kilohertz and what you're seeing is here, the orbiter is on the near side, near side of the moon. The minute the orbiter comes to the far side, bloop, and it's flat, quiet, pristine, it's beautiful. So this is why we should go make our observations there. This all of this RFI that was here right now is not there. It's great. So with that in mind, um, a few of us got together and proposed the far side, which is a telescope um, probe class mission. It's a mission concept funded by NASA to place a telescope on the far side of the moon. And the name we came up with is Farside, very innovative. Um, it stands for Farside Array for Radio Science Investigation of the Dark Ages and the Exoplanets. <laughs> <laughs> now we know why Dark Ages and Exoplanets though, right? Um, and the PIs of this proposal were Dr. Greg Hallinan at Caltech, who I work with, and Dr. Jack Burns at CU Boulder. Now, this is a collaboration between Network for Exploration and Space Science, all professors, grad students, postdocs, all of us are in it, which is where I come into play, and JPL and Blue Origin. Blue Origin, like I told you, Artemis mission is calling for commercial partners to give us payloads. We are tying up with Blue Origin for this. Okay, so mission concept that we have in mind is we're going to have a lander, a central lander, uh, which, and then we'll have a high gain antenna because we have to get the data back and we'll have solar panels for power and keep components now. These are the rovers. These are going to be automated rovers that will have the antenna components to make our array. So these rovers will just roll out. It has pools of tethers on it. In the, in the tether are embedded antennas. So this, the, there will be spools. And in the, uh, underneath this, there will be antennas that will just be laid out. So this is what we're going for. And what will the array look like? How will it be distributed? How our antennas will be distributed? It's shown here on the top left. It sent, it's a bird's eye view of the array. So in the center is the base lander that I just showed you. And the rovers are going out in four arm spiral configuration, uh, laying out the array of interest. Some details about the array, we're going to have 128 pairs of antennas, and it's going to be operating between 100 kilohertz and 40 megahertz, like we decided together. And the antennas are going to be just 100, not just, it's 100 meter dipoles, but dipoles. They simply look like this. They're just like metal wires, but 100 meter long. It's just like wires. Yeah. So that's the plan for the array. Now, the data products, just to give you an overview of what it looks like. Now, the data products are the way we are deciding on how to work with the data products. It's based on another radio telescope, which is in Bishop, which Cameron mentioned. So it's another radio telescope that Dr. Greg Hallinan and Maren Anderson are PIs of. Uh, we're going to learn a lot from that and have similar data products. So main things to take away, we're going to be getting 65 GB of data per day, and we estimate to get all sky, the whole sky image every 60 seconds. Fine. At this point, I, we're talking about data, but how are we going to relay this data back to Earth? We are on the far side. Orbiter? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Relay. Fair enough. I'm going to give it a few, I guess. Yes, low. Yes. Better give it a few minutes if people want to say. But yes, the idea is to have an orbiter. One of the biggest advantage, again, comes from the Artemis mission, the lunar gateway. It is an orbiter, but the Artemis mission is planning this. NASA is planning to build this huge orbiter to support all the missions that might go to the moon. And we're just going to take advantage. It's not extra money. We don't have to fund. We don't have to plan budget it. So we're going to take advantage of it, which is why it's so great for us to do this now. And so we selected a few bands of the lunar gateway that we could possibly use for this mission. And we also have backups. Just in case the far side gets built before the lunar or gateway gets built, we are testing CubeSat release. 
So there's a group at Virginia Tech already building this CubeSat. They're testing it. The plan is we could send a CubeSat relay orbiting around the moon that will look, partially look at the far side and then come back and relay the data to Earth. We have a backup, just in case. OK, and we proposed a timeline and budget. Of course, this has been shifted a little. So if you see, initially, we thought Artemis phase one was going to start. The initial operations will start in 2020. But we had the successful phase one launch only this year. Of course, a lot of things happened. But the biggest thing, it's happening, right? Artemis phase one was successful. It's still on the cards. NASA is still soliciting proposals for the Eclipse mission, the commercial lunar payload services. So we are still in the game. It's just that everything might be shifted by two years. And the overall, just to give you an estimate, the overall uh, budget estimate that we estimated for Farsight, including the launch vehicle and everything, was about 1.3 billion. Now, that's all I had to talk mostly, but I didn't want to put up my conclusion slides before asking what were your main takeaways from what you heard today. <laughs> you can even shout out if typing is, oh, <laughs> magnetic field protects one planet, the other one got fried. Okay, yes. The clapping part was cool, thanks. <laughs> we need a fax machine on the moon, interesting. OK, let's talk more. The gateway has an actual use. Cell, pho cell phones suck, I agree. <laughs> 21 centimeter line is indeed amazing. Whoever said that, thank you. <laughs> Very noisy world we live in. Um, but yeah, far side is a timely probe class mission to place a radio array on the far side of the moon. Uh, the timing is perfect because NASA has renewed its interest to go back to the moon. A lot of technology development is happening. The lunar gateway is happening. We are also getting advancement of capable landers. Overall, Artemis mission is great, and we're taking advantage of it. And the two main science cases, we're looking at the dark ages and studying the radio auroral emissions from exoplanets. And uh, with our probe class mission study that NASA funded is actually ended. We finished that. We did a detailed study on the mission architecture we did a detailed study on the ra architecture we gave them a timeline budget we also gave them a budget um, so we said a proposed launch of 2028 would be great and once you launch it six months hence we will have data of course everything is moved two years now so i'm still have my fingers crossed and let's hope because there's amazing science that can come out of it and and oh i, I wanted to put a picture of my dog so thank you <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I will take some questions. So at what latitude do you want to place the array and why? And that's actually, I guess it's three questions because that's two questions. And the other question is, since there's no atmosphere to protect the instruments, uh, what, if anything, will you do to protect them from like the direct solar radiation they would get when the far side is in, in daylight? Great questions. Um, for the first part of what latitude we would like to put uh, the telescope, well, I should have a plot somewhere. Okay. okay, so sorry, I don't know if I have the plot right now handy, but a one of our collaborators at Boulder, CU Boulder, had done a simulation. It's just, we actually took the electromagnetic properties of the moon, put it inside a simulation, let radio waves incident on it, and see how much suppression we get at different latitudes on the far side. And they found that 45 degrees away from the pole is the desired suppression we need for the detection of the faint signal, 45 degrees. And the second thing, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Doesn't matter. It's an equal diffraction on both the sides. And the second thing in terms of site consideration was to find a reasonably uh, flat area with no boulders. And they, they found three possible craters. I'm not going to attempt naming them because the names are hard. Uh, but we've identified three possible craters within 45 degrees from the poles. Um, your second question. What is, how do you protect the instrument from direct radiation? Yes. Yeah. So we don't know the exact answer. So the way we are planning to go about this is um, we got approved to send, OK, I'm glad you asked the question because there's another <laughs> telescope I wanted to talk about. Um, so this telescope is basically going to answer that for us. And it's going to be launched 
mid-November this year, again through Artemis, Artemis mission, but it's just a single. So this is the radio dipole, but so it's just a single dipole. The idea is to study how much the impact of the solar radiation, how much electron photon sheet exists and how much it affects our um, antenna properties. So we don't know the answer yet, but so we plan to find out the answer by putting a telescope that has just one antenna first. Yeah. And that's this year? This year, actually, mid-November. It's called the Rolsys Ro Ro Mission, and in Intuitive Machines is taking it for us. Yeah. Yes? Just curious. Was the curvature of the dipole arms to broaden, to detune it a bit and broaden the frequency? Uh, reception range. Ah, so that we ideally don't want to don't want the curvature on the dipoles. We want them to be straight. Um, did you see a curvature in something? Oh, oh, wait. The, okay, sorry. I know what you're doing. Okay, yeah. It's so, yeah, yeah. Let me see if I can get this. There we go. Yes. Um, okay, so the dipoles are going to be straight, but so what is happening, the whole array is going to be, so there's one dipole here, then the, the, the rover moves and sets the other one in a curved pattern. The individual dipoles are straight. So it's a series dipole. That's a series. Yeah. Yeah. And that pattern is chosen for better sensitivity of the telescope. We did a lot of simulation and this, these curved arms would be great for us. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Oh. Get my steps in here. Thank you. So some other space agencies recently landed on the far side of the moon. Did they find anything cool? Yes. So a couple of space, space agencies recently was, I don't know if you're talking about ISRO's landing. ISRO's landing was on the South Pole, not technically the far side. But I'm hopeful they will find one biggest question that ISRO is also going to answer is if our solar winds, how much impact they will have and just basically see, get and what the radio environment looks like. We haven't got data since the 1975, even from the South Pole. So they will find that. So I think ISRO's initial landing is to show capability that it's possible. And it was amazing. But the other uh, telescope that landed was um, Chang E two years ago. Am I saying that right? With the uh, the with the telescope from so it was chang e orbiter but the thing that landed was netherlands uh instrument um sadly uh they realized um they looked at their data and they realized they had their own instrument generating more rfi than expected i told you the instrument noise you have to plan for the moon too <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was. I was just wondering about. Uh, so, what does the process going forward look like? So, was this just a proposal, or is it like approved to go up on? A That's a great question. So, this this particular telescope was definitely a proposal because NASA takes funding for also mission concepts, like what, what ideas do you have? Um, but going forward, we have a couple of telescopes in place that are definitely launching and it's funded for launching. One is the Rolses, which is going, which is already and is going this mid-November. The other one that's going is called Lucy Night, which is basically going to do the Dark Ages exploration on the far side. It's called Lucy Night because we're going to the far side, uh, but it's again, just a single antenna. So it's not a lot of antennas. It's not, you're going to not get enough sensitivity you need, but you could do basic science. You could at least test the environment and that's funded. That's funded to go in 2025. And then we wait and see when, as NASA calls for more proposal, we will repropose far side. And I must mention, since I have a minute here, uh, NASA funds these concepts called uh, NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts is way into the future, like give us the craziest idea you've got. And we did. Uh, so we said, okay, far side is cool, but let's do far view, which is about 100,000 antennas. 
So your sensitivity is even better. It's the sensitivity we really need, actually, if you want to make a realistic measurement. 100,000 antennas, but how do we carry it? We don't plan to carry it from Earth and go. We plan to make these antennas in situ. We will take out metals from the regolith using chemical vapor extraction, deposit, make, these are simple dipoles, this is wires. We might just deposit metal there and make 100,000. So it's, I mean, NASA has funded us to study it. We're, we're studying it, yeah. Last question. Yeah. Will you power our side? Yes. Okay. Good question. Uh, so, two things. One, during the day we're going to use our solar panels. During night, when when we're looking at the sun, solar panels. When we're not looking at the sun, we're going to have radioactive uh, generation. I don't know much details, but they're planning to do. It's a it's a it's a radioactive generator that NASA has tested before. It's MM. I might I'll get you the name later, but I just know they're using a radioactive material. Yeah. Exciting. What? Oh, sorry? The lifetime of the radio source, I'll have to look at it, but I'll get back to you. For the radiation source? Radi yeah. It's probably plutonium and then it's a long, long time. time. A long time. Okay, let's thank our speaker. <laughs> thank you, Nevada. All right, so. Um, the clouds are still present, sadly, so we won't be able to observe. However, if you stick around, we're going to have our um, astrophysicist Q&A panel. And I went and got a bunch of copies of our new eclipse glasses. I'm going to give them to Andreas. And as you leave, if you're interested in grabbing a free pair of, of eclipse glasses, you're welcome to do so. Please don't try and grab six for all of your family members and such. We only have a finite, uh, finite amount, but um, well, you're free to take a, a pair for yourself or, or, or of all the people who are here. Um, so we'll have a brief intermission for about five minutes. Again, you don't need to stick around. I'm not holding, you know, I'm not chaining you to here. Uh, but if you want to stick around and ask questions of our Q&A panel, we're going to do that for the next hour or so. So you can stick around. But thanks for joining us. Um, come back for the eclipse in two weeks or go to Bryce Canyon. And uh, we'll see you guys next month or November. Yes. The plan is there a plan? Any carpool? Any kind of question? That's good. Uh, I mean, yeah, I can't organize everyone's transportation to get there. I'd say or like a, a website or something. I could that, maybe uh, make a Google Doc or a Google spreadsheet where people could sign up to like maybe we potentially we can, we can carpool. I'm just to see. I, I don't know whether everyone's camping. There's lodges. I don't know anything. There's like camping, and there there are lodges as well. So there's yeah. both. Is there, is there an exact address you're going to be at? I mean, exactly the main, the visitor, the visitor center of Bryce Canyon. It's a pretty compact. Okay, that's where everyone can come. Yeah, that's right. And we'll have some campsites, but I imagine there will be campsites available for people too. So it should be fun. I'm trying to do the logistics. Yeah. Oh yeah, I'll see if I can arrange a spreadsheet for interested parties to get the contact with each other. Yeah, yeah. Sounds good. Yeah, it went okay. Congratulations. Yeah, I got to, uh, so perhaps I should call you Mr. Holmes. That's right. That's right. Um, All right. Yeah. Can I you while I'm trying to set this up? Sam, do you want to write names of people on the back? Use the big markers here.
Oh, you don't have to worry about full names. Just the just the first name is fine. Okay. All right, we will get started with our astrophysicist Q&A panel. Thanks for those of you who decided to stick it out. Hopefully you've got some good questions for us. Um, we'll just have a brief introduction for each member of the panel so that you have an idea of what sort of science that we, we do and potentially we can speak to. That's not to say the things that we don't mention are not are off limits. You can ask whatever questions you want and we'll do our best to address whatever. Um, I'm Dr. Cameron Hummels. I do research primarily on galaxies and the atmospheres around galaxies, trying to understand why some galaxies are the way they are and others are the way they are. Um, primarily, the, the main discrepancy between galaxies are um, galaxies like our own, blue star-forming galaxies, like disk spiral galaxies, um, versus what are referred to as red and dead galaxies. They don't have any active star formation. They tend to be redder in color because they don't have any young st stellar populations. And they tend to also be um, lack that kind of spiral disk component. They're more like, I refer to them as hard boiled eggs because they're like a big kind of ellipsoidal structure. Um, and so I study those using mostly computational simulations, big supercomputer simulations. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Harshita. I'm an incoming graduate student. So I just started here. Um, I do. Uh, so as they talked about early universe cosmology, I, I do late universe cosmology. So I see clusters, which are the most massive objects in the entire universe. So like the, cam the galaxies that Cameron studies, they just collapse together gravitationally to form these huge galaxy clusters and their distribution. Uh, is something that we can study and that gives us a lot of information about how you know how the universe is how ma ma mass is there how much you know other stuff is there so it's a pretty cool thing yeah uh, i'm navelta and uh, so other than putting telescopes on the moon i'm interested in actually studying how do the very first stars of a universe form so if the dark ages or the toddler years of the universe I think the first stars are like the teenage of the universe. So just like how do the first stars form? Because they're very much different from the sun. You cannot apply the same concepts of how the sun formed to the first stars. You can ask me more about that. So I, I, I like to use radio telescopes to use to study those. Yeah. 
and I'm Sam. Uh, I'm a second year graduate student here in astronomy. Uh, I'm primarily interested in supernova explosions, so the deaths of stars about 10 times the mass of our sun. They explode at the end of their lives very dramatically, or maybe they don't explode. Um, and understanding why they explode, how they explode, watching them explode. Um, these are, I'm really into explosions. I really love them. Um, they're so awesome. So uh, understanding how uh, after the explosion, what kinds of things you get left behind, perhaps a white dwarf like our sun uh, will turn into one day, or a neutron star, or a black hole, or in some cases, nothing at all. Um, understanding how these different objects are formed and why they're formed and actually understanding the morphology of the explosions is something I'm really interested in. Uh, lately, I've been on a bit of a James Webb Space Telescope kick. Um, so I've been interested in a class of explosions which are very red um, because they are very dusty and how that dust is formed uh, by these explosions, which is again very interesting uh, because planets and other things formed later are mostly made of dust. Uh, we're mostly made of dust. So um, this is something that's very interesting to me as well. Uh, questions from the audience. Um, Nevada, so it went without saying in your talk that there is a far side of the moon. In other words, there is a side of the moon that is always facing away from the earth as opposed to, you know, people will often say the dark side of the moon, which is constantly changing. And there is a side that's always facing away from the earth because the earth and the moon are tidally locked. Mm -hmm. yeah. Why are they tidally locked? Ooh, why are they tidally locked? <laughs> Mm. <laughs> I'm just glad it's on the far side. <laughs> that was, I mean, to anybody who, can address it. who wants to talk about tidal locking? Well, I can talk about tidal locking if you guys. Okay, so, uh, okay, let's see. How how do we go into this? Do I illustrate this? No. Um, all right. So when you look up at the moon, you always see the same face of the moon in the sky, right? It always is the man in the moon or the rabbit in the moon or whatever your cultural bias is. You always see the same features on the moon. That wasn't always the case. Um, and when we look at other moon systems around other planets, it isn't always the case. In some cases it is, but it turns out the lowest energy state is for this, this, uh, phenomena called tidal locking, where you end up having one face of your moon facing towards the planet, or one face of your planet facing towards the sun, or that sort of thing. And over time, this happens by um, certain phenomena on those planets, flexing of those planets, or motion of those structures um, that's dissipating energy and essentially causing those things to come into alignment. So what it means for a, a, star, a, a moon to be tidally locked is it means every time it goes around once, it rotates once, right? So, so oh man, I'm gonna use your Coke can, or we can use the other microphone, but that's kind of symmetric. The Coke can, I'm gonna use your Coke can, Harshda, sorry. So um, if it's just doing its own thing and it's not rotating, man, this is a mess. Um, then then you're not going to have that tidal locking but if it if its rotation rate is synced i'm gonna fizz you up wait, your wait. Coke. you should drink more of your coke before i spill it all over me yeah if its rotation yeah exactly there you go if its rotation rate is synced with its orbital rate then you'll get this locking effect but as i said oh yeah it's a good thing you didn't have the coke um <laughs> As I said, this happens because of flexure of the planet or the moon or uh, the fact that we have water on the surface of the Earth that's moving in response to the gravitational field. That's, I mean, that's effectively why we have tides, right? Tides we think of as two times during a 24-hour period when the water gets up and then the water goes back down. But from the perspective of, oh, are you going to draw this? I yes. Like draw yeah, this. go ahead and draw this. But really, it's that part of the water. There, there's a water bulge that's roughly facing towards the moon. And as the moon goes around, it's tugging this water bulge on the surface of the Earth. And we're just remaining, we're, we're rotating through that. And so from our perspective, that is, that is quite, uh, here, let's do it bigger so people can see this. <laughs> so here is the Earth, and here is 
the water bulge. Of course, this is accentuated, and there's the moon. And so as the moon goes around, God, this pen, we need to use the big, the thick pens. Use the big, thick red, yeah, thank you. So as the moon orbits around the earth, it pulls those bulges around with it. And when you here on, oh man, I'm running out of ink. When you are a person standing here and that bulge passes by you, that's when you experience high tide. And so these kind of things are dissipating some of the energy, the orbital, or the uh, rotational energy of the moon and causing that rotation rate to come into sync with the orbital rate until you eventually get this locking effect. So does that kind of address your question? And yeah, ultimately when you have locking, then you always have a far side of the moon that is not visible from here. But yeah, Pink Floyd really messed everything up when they said the dark side of the moon. There is a dark side of the moon, but it's not permanently dark. It was worth it to have that album though. It was a good album, it was a good album. But that's like saying, oh, the dark side of the earth. Well, right now we're on the dark side of the earth, but in 12 hours, we won't be. And it's the same thing on the moon. Um, oh man. All these markers. I need a different color. There's green. Okay, yeah. So eh, here's our green sun. You know it's a sun because it has rays. And so it's illuminating this half of the, of the moon, and it's illuminating this half of the earth. So right now, this is the dark side of the earth, and this is the dark side of the moon. And in this case, the dark side of the moon is the, the side that's facing the earth. But when the, the moon is on this side, then the, the, the side that's facing us will be illuminated, and the far side will be the dark side. So, so yeah, the dark side of the moon, there is a dark side of the moon, it's just not permanently dark. But the far side of the moon is permanently the far side that we can't see. And the first time humans saw the far side of the moon was when the Soviet Union uh, was successful in putting a mission that orbited around the moon. I think it was Luna 2. Is anyone going to correct me? I think it was Luna 2, and it was a mission that was orbiting around, maybe it was Luna 3. It was a mission that was orbiting around the moon, and they took images of the far side of the moon, and thus many of the features on the far side of the moon are named for Soviet scientists and Soviet histor historical figures in the same way that many things on the near side are named by Western things because Galileo was essentially the first person to identify different structures on the near side um, when he first pointed a telescope at the moon. So, so there's like a Mare Muscovium, Muscovium on the far side of the moon, the, the Moscow Sea, it's not a sea, but it's, a, it's a, like the Sea of Tranquility, it's a big basalt plain, and it's named after Moscow because if you discover something, you get naming rights, I guess. So, so um, but yeah, Nevedita talked about how the Chang'e 3 mission, 4, forgive me, for the Chinese Chang'e 4 mission landed on the far side of the moon uh, a couple of years ago and, and had some operations there for like a day or two uh, before it ran out of batteries. But yeah, it's exciting. It's very exciting. Okay, that was a super long-winded explanation. Um, Sandy has a question. Oh, you have to wait for the mic, Sandy. Okay, well, this is about explosions and supernova. And one of the most remarkable ones that I've heard of is the Crab Nebula, which is a pulsar, which about 7,000 years ago was a supernova. And what's uh, amazing to me is that it was a bright spot in the sky noted by both Arabian and Chinese astronomers back in, I think it was 1054 AD. Uh, and it was described as a bright spot in the sky. When will we have <laughs> the pleasure of seeing such a bright spot? How often do they occur? Yeah, so the Crab Nebula is a bit of an interesting example, actually. It might be a more unusual uh, one of these class of so we divide supernova into two classes there we divide supernova into many many classes you can sort of pick two out of that there are the core collapse supernova which are the end of lives of massive stars about eight times the mass of our sun um, all the way to like 
40 times the mass of our sun. Um, and when they reach the end of their lives, they sort of just explode by themselves. There are also type 1a supernova, um, which are the result of uh, a binary um, evolution where you have a white dwarf, which is what our sun will end its life as, uh, which is a creating mass and eventually exceeds some limit and then explodes itself too. So the rates for these are actually somewhat surprisingly comparable. You expect about one every century, um, either type 1a or core collapse um, in a galaxy like our Milky Way. Of course, this is dependent on how many stars you're forming. So like Cameron mentioned, the uh, difference between like the spiral galaxies and the elliptical uh, red galaxies. So um, in these red galaxies, you're not forming stars anymore. You maybe don't see um, very many of these explosions. But in a spiral galaxy like our own Milky Way, you might expect to see one every 100 years. We haven't really. We're waiting for one. We're hoping in the next 10 years that we might see one. Of course, you know, there's some stochasticity uh, to these rates, right? You might go 200 years without seeing one. You might go 300 years without seeing one. Um, and then maybe see like two in a couple of years. Um, but yeah, we're hoping soon. I really, really hope um, within the next 10 years, maybe the next 25 years, it would be fantastic to have a galactic supernova. Um, yeah, so. Supernova observed all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, you could get more. Yeah, maybe once every 1,000 or 100 or 200 years. Um, it just depends on where you see it in the galaxy. So maybe it's like on the other side of the plane. And so there's a tons of like dust and stuff on the way. So if you've ever seen the Milky Way, like on a very dark sky, um, you'll notice that there's like lots of light points, but there's also some like dark uh, dusty points. So there's a lot of like um, obscuration. It's a lot like, um, I think you guys had pretty bad wildflowers down here too. Uh, but when the sky gets very red and there's lots of like smoke and dust and stuff and the light gets very red and it gets very dark and it really never gets bright uh, during the day, you have the sort of same effect if you look down the plane of the galaxy because there's just a lot of dust. Um, so as long as the supernova is sort of, you know, either to the left or to the right and not all the way on the other side of the disk, we'll be able to see it um, even with our naked eye. Like even the, so the, there was a supernova that occurred in 1987, um, a famous supernova. It was the first discovered of that year. So it's 1987A. That's how the classifying goes. Very, very generic. <laughs> but um, that was near the edge of our Milky Way galaxy. And that was visible in the Large Magellanic Cloud, a, a, a nearby galaxy that you can see in the Southern Hemisphere, but you can't see in the Northern Hemisphere. And yes, that wasn't like a bright spot in the sky, but I think it was naked eye visible. So, so you could you could see it, but it wasn't as bright, nearly as bright as the 1054 supernova that led to the Crab Nebula. Um, oh, I'm trapped really, by one. Uh, I think uh, I got a big voice. Okay. <laughs> so in 1987, when that supernova happened, was all the mathematics there? How the distance the light traveled to let us know was exactly the distance to where it was. So we can't notice a supernova unless the light that reaches us, right? Or unless the telescope could reach at that point. Right, so this was based on when the light actually reached us, right. even though the distance to the object, distance to the LMC is, yeah, it's like on the order of a few hundred KPC, so like a, a million light years or so. And so it would have occurred a million years in the past, but traveled to us. But yeah, I mean, this is all predicated on when the light arrives at us. So it's, it's based on our, our timing, so. Regardless of when it actually physically occurred. When they say the, uh, the Arabian and Chinese astronomers saw it, or, or maybe they weren't called astronomers, they were just seen. I'm, I'm wondering if there wasn't any, was there a written record of that? Yes. Was there a historical record of the. Uh, yes. 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 Yeah. Oh, yeah, there was. There, it's there's a book somewhere. Or was it just passed down word or not? How did they? No, I think how did they record it? It's written, recorded. Yeah. So there are there are a lot of um, yeah, a lot of records from China observatories where people actually wrote these things down. It's actually really funny. Sometimes you'll see citations in papers to like the the original uh, observations if you can go that far back. Um, this is they're like even like 
hundreds or two hundreds or three hundred years press. old. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, but there, there was records, maybe in, in cuneiform or. or <laughs> Yeah. Um, is do stars give any sort of like um, warnings? Like, can, can, can you look at certain stars and say, "Oh yeah, that one's gonna blow soon." Yeah. So this is something we're really interested in doing, um, actually. So the the types of stars that you might expect to see these core clap supernova from um, are called red supergiants. Um, they're very very large. They're very very bright. Uh, we know of quite a few in the Milky Way galaxy. Perhaps the most famous example is Betelgeuse. Uh, Betelgeuse probably won't blow with any of our uh, explode within any of our lifetimes, um, but the first signal that you might expect to see from these red supergiants would be neutrinos. Um, so, as you know, neutrinos or uh, neutrinos are interact with very few things, um, so they will uh, escape from a star much much faster um, than any kind of photon can. The photons interact with matter and stuff around the star all the time. So even as the core is collapsing, there's still this like envelope of material around it and all the photons are trapped in there. And you won't actually see the signal from the supernova until those photons can escape. So you, you might even like a couple days early be able to see a signal in neutrinos. So there are a couple of neutrino telescopes now that are actually looking for these signals. You might also expect to see a signal from the red supergiant itself. Um, you might see it like pulse or get brighter and stuff. Uh, there was a lot of excitement in the news maybe a year and a half ago um, that Betelgeuse had uh, changed its luminosity and that might be an indication uh, that it's going to explode. It should be noted that the red supergiants themselves, they have some variability um, that you can track. Uh, one of the red supergiants I studied in undergrad was called VYCMA. Um, so it had records going back like 400 years um, of variability, which just turned out to be uh, times that it was losing mass um, and that made it get a lot brighter and you could track the, those changes in brightness. Um, but that also might be an indication that something is going to explode soon. But I, I'm really excited for the possibility of neutrinos. Um, and this is another reason that we're really looking forward to having a, a supernova within our own galaxy. You don't really have a chance of seeing the extragalactic neutrinos, but maybe you would be able to see them if they're in uh, our own Milky Way um, and be able to detect that signal and get a better understanding of what's happening in the cores of these stars as they explode. I just wanted to add, not a scientific comment, but if you're interested in looking, at least I'm, I like looking at Betelgeuse's brightness temperature that uh, Sam just mentioned. Betelgeuse has a Twitter account, and every day I check, is it increasing? Can <laughs> we see it? Really? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Betelgeuse shows That's good. live brightness tracking there. Yeah. A mailing list for neutrino detectors, too. A mailing list for neutrino Sure. Hello, cool. Um, yes. So this is about uh, tidal locking. Now, do you need the two bodies to be of different masses? Because it seems like if you're going to slow down the moon's rotation, you kind of need a lot of mass in the other one, because only partially uh, a partial amount of mass should be able to slow it down, right? Well, it works in both ways. And in fact, I guess we didn't talk about this, but the Earth's period is changing as well. Its rotational period is changing as well because of the effect of the moon. But of course, because the Earth is more massive um, than the moon, there's more of an effect on the moon and that's why it's tidal locked first. But uh, over time, the moon is actually traveling farther away from us uh, by, I think it's like a centimeter per year. We've been able to measure this because when the Apollo missions went up, they installed some reflectors on the surface that we've been shooting lasers at that tell us very precisely the distance to the moon. And so it's slowly uh, changing its, its angular momentum over time. And that I think correlates with the change in the rotation rate of the earth as well. So, so it eventually assuming that the sun wasn't going to puff up and incinerate all of us in 5 billion years and such. But, but eventually, if you left this two body system in check, eventually the earth would become tidally locked to the moon as well. And so we would have like a, a 28 day rotation period, just like the, the moon has in its ter terms of its orbital period. And we'd, we'd, we'd always be gazing lovingly at them and they'd be gazing lovingly back at us. And we'd have, there'd be like a, a far side of the earth that would never see the moon and there'd be a far like there is now there's a far side of the moon that never sees the earth so 
Um, so yeah, it works. It doesn't have to be that one is more massive. You can have this for two identical mass objects if there's some way of dissipating the energy from the from the interaction. Yeah, yeah you can see this in binary star systems. So there are binary star, star systems which have comparable masses in each uh, a star, which then become tidally locked. Um, if you can measure their spins, this is hard to do because they're so far away. But I think we have at least a couple systems um, that I wouldn't be able to name offhand. But yeah. Um, before we, get, there have been a few really good questions online that I wanted to get to, notably discussing some of the stuff associated with uh, Navetta's presentation, and that is. Um, are there any thoughts on not allowing radio transmissions from relay satellites on the far side of the moon to keep it radio quiet? Like, obviously, like right now is the pristine time and it's it's free of any kind of radio frequency interference, but it won't be in 50 <laughs> years when, you know, there's all kinds of lunar colonies set up and there's orbiters and 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 all of the technology that might be there. So how do we how do we keep it radio pristine? Communication is key. No, yeah. <laughs> what I was saying is uh, the main thing, that's a great question. So not only are we looking at technology development and looking at how these telescopes would look like, there are a lot of us interested. It's not just NASA. Europe, the European Space Agency is also interested in putting these telescopes on the far side of the moon. So India has already gone to the South Pole. So the idea is to form a group right now. It is an informal group, but PIs from different countries on these different missions are talking and we're trying to set policies in space uh, in place for how this will be what how will you protect your receiver so that you don't interfere yourself and you don't interfere us also but this has been just talks between astronomers and the astronomy missions so there are talks of putting cell phone towers on the far side of the moon and that's worrisome, and we are working towards getting them on the table in these discussions, but not yet. Yeah. It just seems, I mean, space law, I realize is its own oh, thing, yeah. but it seems really challenging to get everyone to agree, and not just na national entities, but international Elon Musk yes. and Jeff Bezos and yes. every other <laughs> astro mogul who's going to be putting stuff into space to yeah. agree like not to spoil yeah. the pristine environment. Yeah. I must know this might be a segue, but I must note that Starlink that's out there right uh, now is great for the internet, fine, but our maybe not, but our telescopes, for example, Cameron mentioned the telescope in Bishop, the long wavelength array, which is led by a group in Caltech. We operate at really low frequencies and we've already started seeing reflections from Starlink as our extra RFI. It's annoying. Yeah. Yeah, I wish yeah. had taken, I wish they had taken precautions of insulating their systems. Yeah, they keep radiating, or they're supposed to radiate in a specific band. And they radiate they lower. Radiate they keep radiating lower. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. They're also oh, bad for yeah. optical astronomers. We see them in <laughs> any exposure longer than about four minutes or five minutes. You see a satellite track going across it. And then if your thing is behind it, well, too bad. Um, related to this, there's there's an additional question, and that is, what is the anticipated mission lifetime for uh, Farside and uh, the associated missions? And you you talked about um, potentially installing larger arrays after some point in time, but is this to be for ten years, or is this yeah? What, what's the time scale for this? Uh, so the time scale that we left Farside at was actually based on a power source. I don't know the name of the radioactive uh, uh, radioactive reactor that they're going to use, but we estimated that lifetime to be about eight to nine years, okay. and that's going to be the lifetime of Farside. Uh, now, with Far View, the future missions is way into the future. And again, I wanted to stress: if, I think right now, if we put out these ideas of like, oh, we have capabilities, we have machines that can extract metals from the regolith. We have shown it on Earth. We have shown it working in vacuum on Earth. Um, this could be a thing in reality 20, 30 years down the line. Yeah. But you have to start these concepts now. Yeah. Building them now. Yeah. OK. Questions? Brian. Um, going back to the 1054 supernova, if I recall correctly, that was visible for like very bright for like a couple of weeks or a couple of months is that there's a follow-up to this but but it, something like that yeah about 100 days probably 
a hundred days. Okay, so a few months. So I had not really thought about this until this discussion because I've been, you know, really looking forward to Beetlejuice going supernova. Wake up every day and hope that this is the day. But it, it, it only just occurred to me that if it happened in the summer from this latitude, we wouldn't see anything. So you, you, would it still be, how bright would it still be by the time it becomes visible at this latitude as you get towards the winter? Yeah, so I- and Does it I, matter, like, does the distance matter, the size? I mean, obviously it's already very, very big. Right, so we won't know Betelgeuse explodes until, you know, however many light years it is away, which I don't know. But, but having arrived, yeah, you say, and then the supernova starts. Um, they usually rise over a period of like a couple weeks, maybe two to three weeks. And then um, there are a couple different classes of supernova. It's not entirely clear which one Betelgeuse will, will become. There's, there's a class of supernova which are called uh, type 2P, where the P is a plateau. Um, so they stay fairly bright for a couple of months, um, maybe 100, 120 days. Um, some of them fade quicker. Again, we don't really know why. Um, that we understand exactly why, uh, which class Betelgeuse is going to be. Um, it might be more of the ones that tend to fall off sooner because we know Betelgeuse doesn't have a ton of um, circumstellar material. Um, so you tend to see the longer supernova when they have a lot of uh, material around the star itself and then that's actually getting, um, the supernova hits it and then that stays illuminated for a really long time. Uh, so maybe you expect uh, Betelgeuse to fall off uh, sooner. but it should be fairly bright for a while. And even if you're not, you know, seeing uh, like it's peak brightness, you know, maybe 300, 400 days later, you still be able to see it. I think the crab was visible for like a year um, in the sky where, you know, maybe it wasn't at its peak brightness at the end of that year, but it was still something that you could see with the naked eye. So yeah, I would, I wouldn't worry about it being the wrong season. <laughs> yeah, if Beetlejuice explodes, you're going to be able to see it. We have more questions online if there aren't. Oh, but we'll give the in-person audience override power. Oh, do you have a question? No? Yeah? So, like, if stars actually explode, why do they explode anyways? This is such a great question. Um, so, it's not entirely clear that we understand all mechanisms of the explosion, um, but thinking about these core collapse supernova. So the stars are, have a lot of mass, um, and just like we're pulled to the bottom, the Earth by gravity, because we have mass and the Earth has mass, the star itself, its mass is always trying to pull it down and pull it really close together. The only reason that it's able to stay up is because it's really, really hot, so it has a lot of pressure. Um, if you've ever, like, microwaved a, uh, something and then it exploded. Like I love to eat tomato soup and sometimes I put my tomato soup in the microwave, but if I leave the cover on um, and I don't remember to like have the little vent hole, it'll explode, right? That's because when things are hot, they have a lot of pressure. Um, and the reason that the interiors of stars are hot is because they're basically nuclear bombs. Um, they're constantly fusing hydrogen into helium um, and eventually, I'm gonna draw something here. It's gonna be not great, I'm sorry. But you can only do that for so long. So this is like a, a binding energy. So the amount of energy you can get by creating something, you sort of go up like this, and then you go up like this, and then you go here. So um, on this side, you might have something like uranium. Uh, over here, you might have like hydrogen. This is helium. Um, but you get sort of to like a peak of stability at iron. So on this side, you're able to fuse and get energy and get hot. From this side, you're able to have a uh, fission. So this is like um, uranium, plutonium, um, sort of the original nuclear bombs uh, created energy through fission to get back to lighter elements, which had higher bounding energy. Um, but when you're fusing, like your star, you're going from hydrogen to helium, you reach a peak um, where now suddenly you can't fuse to a heavier element and still get energy um, and you're sort of stuck. So now there's nothing to go against um, the, the power of gravity. The star starts to collapse in on itself. Um, but quantum mechanically, you can't actually 
cram everything into a single space. You hit sort of like a, a limit of degeneracy. It's like hitting the floor, right, with a tennis ball. The outer layers of the star are falling, 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 falling. They hit this floor and they bounce back up. And that's what we see as a supernova explosion. Now you might ask, okay, when we see a black hole, um, that's when you've even like pushed beyond the limits of quantum mechanics. You've forced everything down into a single point, and now there's like nothing there, and it all collapses to a single point. So that's why I say sometimes massive stars explode, but sometimes they might not, and we don't see that at all, right? They just, oh, they lose all their pressure support, and then they collapse to a single point without ever getting bright. Um, but what we expect when we see supernova is when they have this like uh, very, very dense core thing, and the envelope has now fallen down, and then it gets pushed back up. Um, and gets very, very bright as it shocks um, and expands and heats up again. Yeah, that's a great question. Excellent explanation, Sam. Thank you. Oh, Sorry. boy. That was alarming. Um, questions? Question? Okay. Oh, okay. Um, so this is just for Nivedita, uh, sorry, uh, Nivedita. Uh, so I, I think this is more of a design question for your satellite. Did I see that um, it's built on, it's uh, mobile on rovers, you're saying, or is it, is it actually, in fact, stationary? Uh, okay, so they will, uh, they will be on rovers yeah. when they get transported from Got here it. to the moon, and the rovers will deploy them, and then it'll operate in a stationary, they'll just be there. Gotcha, yeah. gotcha, yeah. okay, yeah. That, that's all I wanted yeah. to know. That was a good question. I, it, I was curious, like, okay, how are you going to maintain that, you know, but right. if it's going to be offloaded, yeah, it makes but sense. There's one advantage of the rover. In case we lose communication, we, we plan this advance. The reason we're sending four rovers also is in case we lose communication, worst case with one, we will send a signal for the rovers to move and make the three arms symmetrical. So we also had like a fail safe, like, okay, we are preparing for it. <laughs> Great, yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. Question? Uh, actually, it might, it's a mix of a question and a comment. So are like solar systems related to a atom structure? Because I noticed how the, like the placement of everything is like really similar. So I'm like wondering if it's like related. Uh, that's actually a good question. So uh, that's how they started thinking about it in the first place because um, so the first model of the atom that was developed was actually pretty similar because they were like, okay, you're, you're, you're getting pulled in. So in the case of gravity, you're getting, the sun is pulling the earth in, but there's also what is called the centrifugal force. So for example, when you like, you know, go in a car and then you make a turn on the, on the way, you feel this force pushing you towards the side of the car, right? That's called a centrifugal force. So it's the gravity which is pulling you in and it's the centrifugal force which is keeping you out that's why you're on this like stationary or not stationary you're on this orbit which doesn't fall in, into the star right so uh, when people started thinking about atoms uh, they thought okay maybe this is similar right but in this in in the case of atoms it wasn't gravity it was the electrostatic force which is uh, or, or basically the yeah the coulombic force which is attracting say a proton in the center positively charged proton or and an electron which is negatively charged so positive opposite charges attract right so it was pulling it to, together but then they're like okay let's give velocity to electrons and then uh it sort of starts moving in so originally they did think that was the correct picture of the atom based on pretty similar um dynamics of the two systems uh but as quantum mechanics rolled in and you know uh, more, be, better theories developed and be, more experiments denied the fact that this is the case. Uh, it's actually a pretty more complicated picture because quantum mechanics is just weird. It's like nothing is really there. It's all probabilities. Electrons are weird and they might be there. They might not be there. It's just a, it's just a mess. So uh, the simplistic picture is, yes, true and mostly works for a lot of cases. So the, the simplistic picture answers a lot of questions. but. If you really want to be a quantum mechanics person, then yeah, it gets harder than that. But yeah. No, that was great. Challenging questions. Challenging questions. 
Okay, somebody in the back. I know, but the, the YouTube audience can't hear the mic so well. And then they're like, what? What was this question? Uh, so my question is for you. Um, can you tell us more about the collision between the Milky Way and Andromeda? Sure. So just we've talked about this in the past, but just so everybody knows that the Milky Way is on a collision course with the Andromeda galaxy, our nearest kind of massive galaxy. Uh, I mean, it's not super close, but it's close as far as galaxies go. And in the next five to eight ish billion years, we're going to collide. And I know that's a long range of times, but it's because it's actually going to take a while for us to collide. It's not like two rocks smashing into each other. These are extended objects and they're moving and they're going to slowly kind of coalesce. Now, my little hand gesture doesn't do a very good job of how this collision will occur. But if you um, if you look up on Google and say Milky Way Andromeda collision video, uh, I mean, you'll probably see some BS, but you'll also see there's a lovely simulation that was done about 12 years ago or so now um, by Roland Vandermeer and Gertina Besla doing a full simulation, a hydrodynamic gravitational simulation of how this will behave, how this will take place over the course of 8 billion years. And it's actually really beautiful to see. And during that process, you have two, the Andromeda galaxy is a lot like our galaxy. It's one of these spiral disc-like galaxies that you kind of think about when you think of the platonic ideal of galaxies. And when they merge, they will wipe away essentially their rotation, wipe away their disks. And what will remain will be a single galaxy instead of these two galaxies. They'll merge together and form what I referred to before as an, as an elliptical galaxy, one of these kind of red and dead galaxies. And the reason, so we refer to them as red because, well, first of all, the light that you see from galaxies is primarily starlight. It's just lots and lots and lots and lots of stars, but you can't usually make out the individual stars because they're so numerous and they're so far away. And so they blend together into that spiral structure. Or when we look up and we see the Milky Way overhead, it looks like it's milk, but it's actually composed of many, many, many little tiny dots of light, but they're so far away and they and they're so close to get, well, they appear close together, so they blend together into this kind of extended single structure. It's the same thing with these galaxies. And when they merge together, we'll see, instead of it being disks, we'll see this elliptical kind of ellipsoid on the sky um, that'll appear kind of reddish white uh, because it's devoid of new stars that tend to be bluer in color. So it's, it's kind of reddish. And astronomers being the creative jokers that we are, uh, we'll call this object, instead of Milky Way and Andromeda, we'll call it Milkomeda, because what else would you call it? Um, Andromache, and yeah, Androxyway, that's, that's good, I like that, Androxyway. You should, we should start a, start a, a an alternative, yeah, discussion of this, and Androxyway, that's pretty good. Um, and... The thing that's worth noting about this is, despite the fact that these two objects are colliding, the likelihood that individual stars in either of those galaxies, there's like 100 billion stars, will collide is very, very low. Because most of the space in a galaxy is actually composed of space. Large, vast distances in between the individual stars are the planets that compose those structures. And so it's like, you throw them together and they very few of the individual stars will actually, we, we don't expect any of the stars to actually hit each other. They'll just kind of pass through each other. Um, but slowly their gravitational effect, masses will pull and accrete and coalesce into a single structure. So, yeah. Uh, I'm, you've already asked two, I'll get back to you, but there's a question in the back. Thanks. So um, this is kind of an open-ended question, so take it wherever you will. Um, but I'm interested in how, because um, you were talking about simulations and how they simulated um, Andromeda and the Milky Way colliding. Um, what kind of parameters do you usually like, input into your um, simulations to simulate things? Have there ever been um, any times where you've been able to 
um, actually see one of these predictions come through uh, true through a simulation. Um, I know like um, the Planet Nine theory came from a simulation where um, they, you know, it wasn't making sense how the solar system formed in the way it did, and then they tried to put an imaginary planet in there, and then it made sense. Um, but yeah, I'm just interested in how how you go about building these simulations, and then what kind of things that you've you've learned from them. Sure, sure. There's lots of different kinds of simulations that people use throughout, I mean, throughout science in general, but certainly even in the field of astrophysics. The sorts of things that we do in galaxy studies, the stuff that I work on, are, again, pretty varied, but I'll just tell you about the, the kind of stuff, kind of the generic stuff. So I guess the first simulations that people did in galaxies were just very, very simplistic. They represent a bunch of star particles that are all kind of, I'm going to try and illustrate this. Okay, good, good pens here, good pens. Um, so they, the first ones were actually done on punch card computers in the 1970s. Uh, and what they did is they, they took a handful of, I think the first ones were actually two-dimensional and they didn't worry about the third dimension. They, they had stars that they gave positions and velocities to and masses to. And in this case, I'm trying to, these are meant to be points. They are not points because I'm not a good illustrator. And they gave them a net rotation. So these are little arrows meant to represent the velocity of the individual point sources of the stars. So this is meant to be just a generic galaxy where each point is a star. And they did that again here with a bunch of points in two, like two or three co-rotating rings, where again, you're just giving it positions and velocities and masses. And the key to giving it a mass is, as we've talked about, gravity is an attractive force. And if you have mass and something else has mass, then you can calculate a gravitational attraction between those two point masses. And so this works by um, calculating for, for, for each, you start out with your initial conditions, and then you calculate at those initial conditions, what is the gravitational acceleration on this point due to that point and due to that point. So it's pulled a little that way and it's pulled a little that way and it's pulled a little that way and it's pulled in all these different directions. And you can figure out what the acceleration will be on that point and then move forward a time step, some finite period of time into the future, taking into account that acceleration for all of these different points from all the other points and then repeat the process time step by time step by time step into the future. And when, uh, when they did this, they recognized that um, the, you slam these two galaxies, these two two-dimensional, very simplistic views of, of spiral galaxies into each other, you start to develop what are known as tidal bridges and tidal tails, which we can see when we look up at images of galaxies that are interacting, where you get like, a long tail of stars coming off here or a or a, a a bunch of stars connecting these two structures they're what what are known as interacting or sometimes irregular galaxies and again if you look up online irregular galaxies into google you'll see some beautiful illustrations of this but this is one of the first you know in some ways this answers your question this is one of the first ways that we did simulations of astrophysical phenomena and it immediately revealed some of the structures that we see when we look up and Previous to this, we were like, what the heck is going on with these things? Like, why are there these, these long tails coming off these galaxies? What's causing that? And it was very clear that it was caused by the gravitational interaction of two galaxies kind of running into or passing by each other. Now, we weren't seeing that in real time. Those galaxies take hundreds of millions of years to change in there and to develop these features. So it wasn't like we predicted it and then it happened. It was more like we predicted it and then we we're like, oh, look, look at that thing that happened that matches what we did because these timescales are super long. But in response to your question about uh, Planet Nine or, or, or other things, there are predictions that can be made on a on a time scale that we might be able to measure the outcome, but that's primarily on smaller objects like our solar system and the planets in our solar system, as opposed to these large structures like galaxies, because it just takes so long that it's much longer than the lifetime of, of me or you or a civilization even, so.
Do you guys want to add anything to that? I kind of hogged the... Um, speaking of simulations and lifetimes we can possibly see, so we use simulations in radio astronomy and for the dark ages and, the, and also to study the first stars. We have not yet seen it and we don't know what to look for. So we use these computational simulations where we give, let's see, uh, we take volume, we give a sea of hydrogen, we start populating few stars in, give different evolution, we give different parameters for the stars to evolve differently and see how the hydrogen signal, signal changes. There are hundreds, we do these, there are so many parameters you can tune and then you'll get the different outcome of the hydrogen signal. There's about 100 to 2000 possible ways. And then we create a range. We're like, okay, this is, that, that's what I showed. It's about 50 millikelvin, you can expect the signal, maybe 100 millikelvin if you change how the star evolves. And then we design our instruments. So we also use these simulations to be like, okay, this is what the signal we look at from the dark ages and the first stars. Let's design our instruments like this. So it helps in simulations. Also, it helps our, to use simulations to design our instruments. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, please. Uh, it's the exact same thing for large cosmological simulations. So when you have, when you want to know stuff like, you know, what's the nature of gravity or what, how much matter or dark matter is there in the universe, you, you do the exact same thing. You start out with a bunch of points, you start out with a bunch of masses, rapidly evolve them very fast, see how they all clump together to form these huge structures, send up instruments into space, take pictures of huge structures, be like, oh, this is similar. And how do you get those things? You tune your parameters, you fit your parameters. So in addition to building instruments, you also get a lot of uh, data about the universe, a, a lot of insights into some values or some constants or basically what the universe is made of or depends on whatever simulation you're doing and insights into stuff like that from your simulations and matching with data. One last thing I wanted to mention because it just occurred to me. Uh, if you want to look up, there's some really cool plots from this paper. It's a paper by authors Tomb Ray and Tomb Ray. It was a, a father son, I think a father son yeah, group. Is it brother, brother, Yuri and, okay. So T-O-O-M-R-E uh, and Tomb Ray. Uh, yeah, Tomb Ray squared, that's good. Um, <laughs> And so this was like a fundamental result from the 1970s. It's really cool to see the plots from these early punch card simulations. Awesome. Yeah. When modeling uh, galaxies and galaxy interactions, I, I can imagine on uh, star mergers, you're looking at sussing out the subtle uh, Doppler shifts that tell you their rotational speeds and find out what the, the amalgam will behave like in the end. but when you're looking at this, even with good finite state simulations, uh, you it's a very large number of bodies. Do you get into where fluid dynamics represent better represents some of the, the behaviors? Yes. <laughs> Do we use fluid dynamics to better represent large sums of individual particles? Yes. And in fact, we have to use, in this case, in this case, this was like an n-body simulation where we just had finite number of bodies that we were calculating the gravitational interactions between them. Um, but for more advanced things, galaxies are, are composed of gas, which behaves like a fluid and doesn't just behave in a gravitational sense. And so you absolutely need to represent this as a, as a fluid dynamic uh, uh, simulation that takes into account both gravity as well as hydrodynamics. And that is largely the simulations that I work on and many of the people in this department work on. So yes, absolutely. But could you do that purely by representing the number of individual particles as a, as a fluid? It's a little bit challenging because then it's not, I mean, it is a fluid, but, but it may not be, there are collisionless fluids that don't interact in that capacity and don't behave according to Navier-Stokes or the Euler equations. And then it gets a little bit more problematic. So yes, we, we do both gravitational collisionless stuff as well as gravitational and collisional fluid dynamics. It just gets more complicated and more computationally expensive. Um, a person who hasn't asked a question. Sorry, sorry, Brian and Sandy. I'll come back to you guys. Hi, um, this goes for the lecture. Uh, thank you for such an insightful and uh, intuitive um, demonstration. Um, this was regarding the telescope itself when it's on the far side. Um, dur during the presentation, uh, 
40 degrees was mentioned regarding the positioning. I was just curious because uh, radiological interference was mentioned earlier, like mm -hmm. as background noise. What about like physical interference? Like, are you able to move the telescope to accommodate for anything else that might um, ruin, I guess, peak viewing time? Oh, um, that's, oh, so that's a great question. So one thing is in terms of phys physical, you mean on the moon when we, right? Yeah, oh, that's a great question. Okay, so one thing I forgot to mention. Yeah, yeah. No, so one thing I forgot to mention that as the plan is to have stereo cameras on the rovers. So we're constantly getting view of what's there. Um, so we will pre-select the site that is relatively flat, which is, we do have some sites in mind, but what if we had thrown some surprises, which is quite possible because we don't have a clear picture of far side. Uh, so we're going to aim for the forearm spiral, but in case uh, the rover does see something in the camera, we do see it, we will move around it. The camera will help us. So this will change the position of the array than we have planned for. But the idea is as far as we get the position we throw the camera, we are fine. We will again redo the simulation and get a new sense of the eye of the telescope. We call the eye of the telescope as to, so based on how the telescope is laid out, it, it has a different eye on the sky. So as far as we get that position exactly from the cameras, we will just remodel the eye and then look at our interest in science. Yeah. I'll swap out the battery. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, Brian. Um, so when you're talking about the future galaxy merger earlier, and by the way, another portmanteau would be the M31 Ilky Way. Um, so, thank you. Have to wait for it. Uh, so you me you mentioned you you alluded in your answer to the fact that you know most of the light that we see in distant galaxies. Or I mean, it's distant. They're all distant galaxies, but in most of the light we see is starlight, and it's hard to differentiate, you know, individual objects. But 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 yet we do that because we peer into galaxies and we see, you know, the black hole in a supermassive black hole at the center of a galaxy. We see ne nebula, uh, supernovae, whatever. Why are we able to do that? Why doesn't all of that starlight blind us to individual objects within that? mass I mean, how, how are we able to get to penetrate that all that opaque light you guys want to talk about this we can talk we can all talk about this zoom in enough and it it get, it pixelates things if you get close enough to your television you're looking at your television and it's beautiful oh look at all this uh whatever scene it's trying to do and you get close enough and close enough and close enough and you can see the individual pixels that are making that up it's the same thing with the galaxy or andromeda galaxy or the milky way obviously we're not getting close but we're zooming in with our telescopes and you can see the individual stars that are present that are responsible for the light that we see and there are problems when in dense regions there's something known as stellar crowding where you have too many stars that are present in a field and you're trying to like hone in on a single star maybe there's something special about that star but it becomes difficult to isolate that star from all the other stars that are present because it's it's such a dense field and there are so many dense sources so yeah please sam yeah it's all a question of resolution so um there's a binary star system called Albireo, uh, which if you look at it with just your eyes, which have a certain limit of resolution, it appears just, just a single bright spot. But then you get a telescope, you're able to um, magnify it more, you're able to actually tell the difference between them. Um, this is a big problem. Uh, I used to work in galactic center science, so um, there are a lot of stars at the center of the galaxy, and you want to be able to resolve the orbits of them to learn stuff about the black hole in the center, uh, but you really suffer from confusion. Um, so this sort of work didn't really take off until you had adaptive optics on ground-based telescopes. So um, our atmosphere is always jiggling around. Um, that causes you know things to sort of smear into each other. Um, but if you're able to reduce that, uh, get rid of that jitter using adaptive optics, then you get much better uh, and now suddenly you're able to resolve stars at the galactic center and make measurements um, so my undergrad advisor's advisor uh, won the nobel prize of course for the the um this is andrea gez at ucla um, along with reinhard genzel and was there a third on that prize on there uh 
the glasses. Yes, but it wasn't for it wasn't Sagittarius for the, A star. The it was Roger Penrose. Yeah, Roger Penrose, but yeah, but yeah. But he yeah, didn't yeah. he wasn't doing stuff on our yeah, supermassive yeah. black hole. Yeah. So what they did is basically um, when you can get that resolution good, now you can actually see the separate stars. This is the same thing for other galaxies. As long as you can get your resolution good enough, then you can suddenly see stars um, in other galaxies. So this is something that James Webb has been fantastic for. Um, it it's, has much better angular resolutions than previous telescopes, and you're able to do it. This is even better in the radio. So maybe I'll let... In the... <laughs> So we are at lower frequency. Okay, yeah. So the resolution, okay. Res frequency. You are resolution actually it's worse, so you have to build bigger. Big you have one telescope, you really huge di diameter. But radio telescope, if you see, we have an array of them. The far side, I forgot again, forgot to mention that we are planning for the longest distance to be 10 kilometers so that we can get the resolution that Sam was talking about at these frequencies. Yeah, because it goes, the resolution gets worse with lower frequencies. Can I just say, like, the reason I struggle, the reason I struggle with this question and ask it in the first place is that I, it makes, like when you talk about the example of the double star, which I've seen through telescopes right back here, um, there's, so mu there's so much empty space, right? And we're, we're within it. But at the distance that these other galaxies are, it just, it, 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 I have people intuitively understanding how we can zoom in so far that we can make, make sense of that, that we can, that we can essentially zoom in to the point where we see empty space. We have billions of stars shining all in a soda straw on the sky or less. Whereas here we're within this and there's just all kinds of empty space around us. So, you know, we, we look at these two stars and we don't have to, we don't have to magnify it very much to differentiate those two stars. But now you're looking at a billion star or a hundred billion stars in a galaxy that just looks like this incredibly bright glob. And yet somehow, you know, it just, I understand your answer and I accept it, but like intuitively it just is hard to grasp. Yeah, well, you think the, the furthest galaxies, they're not that much different than our own Milky Way, right? The stars within them have the similar separations as stars within our own Milky Way galaxy. It's just that those, those angles get much smaller, right? So maybe I'll draw like a, you know, like if you calculate the circumference of a circle, it's 2 pi r, but you can basically say the angular size of anything on the sky, L theta here, right? And this is some like very, very large distance. Um, you can imagine this is like some very, very tiny slice of a pie um, of a whole circle. And essentially what we're saying is, okay, there's some physical separation uh, between the stars, and then there's some distance to those galaxies. What is the like theta that we end up getting? Um, and so of course your theta gets smaller and smaller and smaller, the larger your distance is. So for the most, mo uh, most distance galaxies in the universe, you're never gonna be able to resolve individual stars. Um, but unless perhaps you have like some kind of other effect like lensing but if you're sort of closer in you know this d is small you could get your your theta with your telescope with the sufficient um magnification then there's no reason why you can't resolve individual stars i just think of it like you've got a telescope you're looking at a distant town or a city on the horizon and yeah you look at new york city from I don't know, Staten Island or somewhere nearby. Well, okay. You're looking across the Hudson. I'm from New York City. Don't like to admit that Staten Island. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You're looking from New Jersey across the Hudson at, no, you're even farther away. You're in a plane flying overhead and it's very bright and it's hard to dis distinguish individual lights from the overall thing. But if you have enough resolution, then you can do it. But yes, I agree that it's challenging to think about when you look at this bright thing in the sky being able to identify individual stars that are present in it, but it is possible. This is something people spend a lot of time on too, just like understanding. Um, this is sometimes called confusion because um, you're confused about which stars are actually stars by themselves or actually maybe a couple stars together. Um, <laughs> confusion. Yeah, so this, this is definitely still something we think about. Every time our resolution goes up, an order of magnitude, like with James Webb, um, we say, oh, things we thought were actually individual stars tended out to be, you know, maybe clusters of stars instead. And I think as we continue to get better resolutions, this will continue to happen to us where we'll realize that there's, 
you know, at, you'll get better and better at resolving things and, and our understanding will change. Okay, uh, we have time for like. Oh, <laughs> you, you had a question? Okay, I'll get to you, Sandy. Do you, uh, are there any existing predictions on what we might find in the teenage years of the universe? Um, yes. So the teenage years of the universe, just to go back, is when the very first stars formed. Um, so the predictions that we have, the way we do these predictions, I'll take a step back and say, so when the first stars formed, it formed in a sea or pool of hydrogen. So again, even when the first stars is going to look at the signal, the same signal from hydrogen, that 1,400 megahertz we spoke about. So how the 1,400 megahertz, that signal changes with time, that is a prediction. It says that as the stars turn on, the, um, the temperature of that signal will dip. You'll get it in minus negative against the microwave background. You'll get a dip. And as the stars evolve further, it starts producing X-rays, this hydrogen signal will start gaining temperature uh, greater than the microwave background. So that prediction is there. And if that answers the question. And I would like to put a plug in that at about a couple of years ago, this one of the telescopes I said was dear to my heart in Western Australia. I don't know if you all saw it in news. In 2018, we had a tentative detection of this dip. It was the very first detection. There's no one. Another instrument in India tried to do the same thing with a similar sensitivity. Did not see what we saw. So that it's up in the air. Did we actually see the signal? Is it our instrument? We're still looking. So, but there are theories predicting it, and we're looking for this little dip, and we're looking for that little rise. But it's really faint. Yeah. All right, Andy. Oh, just please, a small Harshman. thing. Uh, if you wanted a more visually appeasing picture of what it looks like. There's this guy at Stanford called Tom Abel. He did a lot of first star stuff, the young, the first star ever. And he has a very nice movie if you just Google um, uh, him. And it's a very, very pretty picture of how a simulation that he did very long ago, actually, about how, which is also validated very recently about how the first star would look like. All right, Sandy. OK. Maybe final question. It's about AI. We're hearing so much about how AI is going to change the world. What are astronomers thinking about doing with the AI? What changes? Please. Um, it's, OK, before I answer, would neural network fit in the AI bill? What's that? Neural networks fit. Right. Yeah. yeah okay. Neural network so, is considered uh, AI. Sure. So I just wanted to add, at least in radio astronomy, the applications I've known so far is one RFI. So even when we go to the moon, we could ex we want to train a neural network that goes in and does automatic RFI filtering. So we're going to take advantage of that. RFI being radio frequency interference. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it's like the light pollution of the radio spectrum. When it was the clapping. That we it was did. the clapping. <laughs> Just making sure. Yes. And the other thing that I, that I saw recently from a conference was one group in Australia is thinking of using neural network or uh, machine learning to do calibration of radio arrays. Face, to, I'm sorry, I'm using technical terms here, but face closer calibration. So radio arrays that we use to look at the universe, we have to calibrate them. We have to know, what, so the signals we get from the sky through a radio telescope are voltages, but we have to convert them to sky units. So it's called calibrating them. And when we have so many telescopes in array, calibration is hard, getting them to match is hard. So there was a new technique proposed by a group in Australia where they want to use machine learning and phase closures, which is meaning like take sets of three antennas in array. Usually there are 100 antennas. Let's take three, three of them, get a phase closure and do calibration. And they want to use machine learning to do that. Um, but these are, I don't know if that's the AI you were thinking of, but we're- Right. Modeling. Okay. Well, the thing that I was going to add to Nevedita's answer is just that as, as technology develops and our instruments become more and more powerful, we are very efficient at collecting more and more and more data. And whether it's from the, the Vera Rubin Observatory, which is coming online in the next year, 
or ZTF that's, that's run here out of Palomar, or DSA-110 or DSA-2000, some of these large radio telescopes, you're producing an enormous amount of data. And there are only so many people to go through those data and to be able to identify and pull out the relevant, you know, the needles in that, in that haystack. We just don't, you know, you need a lot of people to go through a haystack to look for all those needles. And neural nets, trained convolutional neural nets can identify the thing that, you know, the needles in all of that hay. And so much more efficiently than a bunch of people can. And so that is one big way in which I think AI will be necessary moving into the next generation of astronomical instruments is to have it present to identify the, the good stuff the, the needles in that hay. And that's already happening. Um, we have uh, the ZTF group here, the Zwicky Transient Facility, that's identifying transient objects like short-lived brightening or fading of different astronomical objects, whether or not they're exploding stars or asteroids passing across the field of view of the telescope or very, uh, tidal disruption events where black holes are shredding stars. These things are being identified by AI in uh, codes. Um, there was a scientist here named Dmitry Duev, who uh, was a research scientist for a few years here and coded a bunch of this up. And that in some ways is how the green comet that was in the news earlier this year was identified, was by these sorts of things. Yes, it was validated and confirmed by a human who looked at the results that had been picked out by, by the code the first kind of triage step was done by a computer to identify these things. And I think that will increasingly be used across the field of astronomy. Ultimately, yes, we're going to be the ones doing the analysis and, and writing the papers, but the first kind of step will probably be done by computers to extract out the relevant signal. Well, eventually they may write the paper. You just pass it on to chat GBT and it makes up a bunch of references that are wrong and, these sorts of things, but maybe maybe in the future it'll be better. You guys want to add to this? Oh, I would just add for the, especially with transient science and something we're thinking about with Rubin, which is coming online very soon, um, where we're going to get a lot more data than we got for ZTF is not just to do the finding of the transients using machine learning, but also to do the classifying. So we're living in a golden age of astronomy where, you know, a supernova is a dime a dozen. Um, and if you can, you know, classify the boring usual typical supernova and then have the ones that are sort of defy classification and those are perhaps the ones that are more interesting to write papers about um, that's something that we commonly use machine learning for and even now um, just to compare a uh, specter that we take of new objects to previous objects and let the machine try to classify them and then try to only focus on the things that are sort of interesting and different um, yeah Thank you all for sticking around until late in the, uh, the evening. Um, I want to thank our speaker tonight, Dr. Navedita Mahesh. Thank you. Excellent presentation. Our panelists, Sam Rose, Harshta Saxony. Thank you, guys. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll, as I said, we won't be back next month here. But our next Astronomy on Tap will be Monday, November 13th. Um, the topics will be on Venus and on exoplanets. So it'll be a planet-centric astronomy on tap. And our next lecture will be that Friday, November 17th, uh, just preceding Thanksgiving, all about stars sending out tantrums, throwing little fits and throwing out a bunch of stuff and what impact that might have on the development of life around other stars. And as I mentioned, there will be an eclipse that will be visible from much of the continental United States, but it will be a partial eclipse here in Pasadena. We will have an event Saturday, October 14th, the morning of uh, some, somewhere between 8.30 and 10.30. We'll have here presentations and then uh, telescope, solar telescopes. We are handing out eclipse glasses for free. If you didn't get your pair, come up and grab one at the end or in a few moments. And then if you feel a fancy about going to Bryce Canyon to see the annular eclipse, we'll have an event going on there at Bryce Canyon National Park at the Visitor Center. We'll have stuff on our website. And I'll be at the Grand Canyon for the next six weeks. So come say hi. I'm going to give presentations. It'll be fun. And it's all free. Okay. Thanks, everybody, for listening. We'll see you guys next time.